small MQHC in Nashua. We take care of primarily people who are insured. Uh, it is a struggle. Um, and it's mostly kind of raised that point which I will ignore for a moment because I just want to emphasize how much the lack of insurance impacts the ability to give people the care they need. That getting them to specials, getting them the medication they need, getting them the tests they need, all is difficult. And Medicaid expansion will make a huge difference to that because all of these people are people who are under, not all, but very nearly all, under 138% of the poverty level and currently the best number do not have Medicaid. And the cost shifting that I see on a regular basis to the emergency room care and to the hospitalization of people who really needed chronic illness care but avoided it, even though they may have known that they had some chronic illnesses like diabetes and hypertension. It's just more than any report seems to emphasize, and I want you to understand that, that it is costing all of us because that cost shifting has to go somewhere. It goes to the insured and the wealthy few of whom are uninsured and take their own bills. So this is an economic imperative in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. My name is Robert Dawson. I'm from Rochester, New Hampshire. I'm a direct support worker who supports people with disabilities out of the community in their homes. I'd like to read a poem entitled Poems by Direct Care Workers and Open Letter to the Legislators of All Different States by Dave Morrow. Don't use it against us that we become attached to the people we serve, that we love them as we care for them. Don't think you don't need to pay us enough to have a home, to make a car payment, to bring our children to the doctor. Don't think we'll do it out of the goodness of our hearts, even though our hearts are good. Don't assume your mother will keep her dignity today, that her philosophy bath will be cleaned correctly, that she'll be guided gently through her shower, that she'll take her medication and eat her chicken soup. Don't assume your Uncle John will have a group home where he can make choices, or there'll be someone to call when your husband or your wife comes home after their stroke. Three million direct care workers in our country today, a million more needed within a few short years. Don't assume they'll we'll be there without your help. We are all in an accident or illness away from meeting a direct support worker to help with our most basic needs in life. This direct health care workforce needs guaranteed health care in themselves, or all of our well-being is in jeopardy. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Maria Gavin, and I'm the Senior Vice President at Childhood Family Services here in New Hampshire. Childhood Family Services is the oldest child-serving nonprofit in the state of New Hampshire. We employ over 300 employees and we serve 15,000 people each year. I agree with a lot of the comments that have been made here today, and we can say the same things about concerns for our clients. But today I'm here to speak to you with my concerns as an employer. Most people are surprised when they learn that one of our largest programs at Childhood Family Services provide services, direct home care services, to our most vulnerable, poor senior citizens. We are the link keeping people in their homes and preventing them from entering both state and county nursing homes. We provide these services through state contracts and through charitable fundraising. As a result of that, we are unfortunately unembarrassed to say we cannot pay our staff at least a decent wage. We pay our direct care workers less than $10 an hour to bathe your mother, to get your, um, their medication, to get their groceries, to take them down the icy walkway. We cannot provide health insurance for these employees. So in an agency that is concerned about the welfare of children and families in New Hampshire is unable to provide health insurance for our own employees. So we really hope and really advocate 
for the expansion of Medicaid, not only for our clients, but for the employees who we, our clients depend on every day. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Kay. Uh, 
pretty much across the board. And extending Medicaid and providing the substance abuse treatment uh, method will help um, the end the generational cycle of substance abuse. Um, I've seen students go from, I've seen all of the sort of students going from straight A's and perfect attendance, a lot of treatment, to failing treatment within two weeks of having their training. And I've also seen students get kicked out of their own schools and bounced from place to place. And then when they get the right treatment, they're a student of the month, employed in the community, and everything. But what I want to reiterate here, as some of people have, uh, I'm currently working in a residential facility in the city with 14 young men. And for one of these young men to stay here, it is costing the city, uh, the taxpayers, $500 a week to get to um, $500 a week to house these uh, young adults. And that's not to mention all the services and all the public assistance these broken families are taking are using outside of the center. Um, so addiction costs us money. We're going to be paying for either upfront or a trickle down effect that we offer. And extending using federal funds to extend Medicaid will just help clean up the mess that substance use creates. Us. Thank you for your comments. My is a full description for a lead uh, volunteer that is. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time and your consideration. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, at this time, we know that AARP urges the extension of Medicaid, or the extension of the extension of Medicaid. Uh, and I guess I will not urge you to support facts and figures, but I should say in conclusion. But let me add a couple of things. I want to talk about the people out there, the segment that Claire mentioned, ages 45 to 65. Some people call them the older workers. At my age, I kept calling them the middle aged workers. Yeah. We, I'll put a face on these people. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be a close person to the AARP, and I get to meet a lot of these people. So I'll put a face on them. Because just like most of us in this room, hardworking, great families, self reliant, and they're good community people and they hesitate to ask for help. I think it's about time to put out our hand to them. For someone to go to the have a, not have the medical care, have the health care deteriorate and end up in the emergency room for an illness that could have been prevented is sad. And the whole fact is, it's sad illness. Same way for a person who is 65 after being without a job, struggling and so forth, no, no insurance, entering Medicare at 65 with a key illness that should have been prevented 10 years ago. I think it's by the time we get this up these people, doing nothing is not good. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your time.
And as we move through that, the, the data we go into the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And they compare the data that we produce with the other 1,086 figures all by health centers in the country. And against a publication at that time was called the in 2010. In 2008, Dr. Who Reed from the NIH, Dr. Ahmed Kelvin, the person looked at those data and determined that MSP and health services data for those IDs was in the top 26 in the country. Later on, in this particular CNN, she has a child, so I'm going to discuss a child who is currently in grade school. She's a single mother, and she's actually going back for her RF, and eventually for her baby RF. So this is an individual who, based on what we've heard of the income guidelines, would actually qualify uh, for Medicaid expansion. This is an individual who has worked within healthcare who will ultimately be part of the solution of health care and provide health care for us in the future. So that's just a phase amongst many that you've heard from um, that these are the types of people. And as I see this as an investment, uh, to put it in context, the certified medical assistant makes about $15, $17 an hour when she comes in our end to around $4 an hour than is an advanced practice of the senior. Is in our $40,000. Those are ways that will stay in the national Since many of the points, 
time to already say it, I will uh, see my time.